Yeah, so Paul, you can like, there's t the next street right here at the corner is 28th. Okay. The one after it is 30th. All right, let's go. I could just direct you, right? It doesn't yeah, matter yeah. if I'm saying, yeah, you can make it right here on the video, right? Yeah. Cool. Yep, so I was born with a saxophone in my mouth. <laughs> I'm virtuoso. Um, everybody wants to see. Shut it down. Everybody wants to see what you have to say and hear. So it Just be careful. This this intersection sucks because they don't have a stop sign. Well, there's a guy here. Like, oh my god. Well, we do need a front facing camera. We need a front facing camera. <laughs> we definitely because... need one for things like that. Yeah. <laughs> um. And we're gonna just drive around and ask you questions or whatever. Cool. I think more whatever. Yeah, let's do all of the above. Pretty much whatever. Okay. So, Andrew, mm -hmm. serious question. Mm -hmm. Why do you love music? Oh man. Um, I just. It makes me feel good. It makes other people feel good. Yeah. And you can make other people feel good by playing music. So I, basically, um, I think it's just like a way of communicating and reaching people, you know? And that, that to me is appealing. The first thing that I loved about music was, was pr I mean, why I got into playing the saxophone was just because I loved the sound of the alto saxophone, like specifically. Um, and I had like a teacher early on that gave me like a, a tape, you know, just like in, in one of my first private lessons, he was like, uh -huh. here's some recordings of some guys that you need to hear so you can develop a frame of reference for like this instrument that you're trying to learn how to play. But on one side, it was Cannibal Utterly something else, uh -huh. which is like, I'd still argue is like maybe the best <laughs> recorded alto saxophone sound ever. Um, what about Mercy 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 Live? Yeah, that's pretty good too. <laughs> that that'll yeah, that's that, awesome. That's I mean, one of my favorite Cannonball records. Oh man, for sure, yeah. for sure. But I'm you know that's that's a live record, you know. And, it's and you not can, actually live. It's not actually live. I read the liner notes on it. It was recorded live in a studio, and they brought in people and they set up a bar. And it's an open bar. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and the whole band was recorded live in like a major studio in L.A. It was either like Capitol or. Whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they tried to recreate a the live vibe. vibe. Yeah. Okay, well at least I don't feel like a total idiot for thinking it was live because you hear people. In the I know. Background. I thought it was live yeah. too. Yeah, but it's not actually live. I mean, it's sort of live. Mm -hmm. Like it's in the studio and they brought all these people in. There was an open bar and I think everyone was just hanging out. Right. And then what was the other side? So Cannibal Adderley, um, yeah. something else was on one side, and then David Sanborn up mm -hmm. front, which mm -hmm. is um, like an album from the '90s. Like I don't know that anything about that album. Co-produced by Marcus Miller. Uh -huh. It's actually really hip. The arrangements are amazing there's like a lot of like extra percussion and and horns and um just like all sorts of stuff like the production was was really huge and it's a big big band it actually it's really funny because when i hear an album like that it reminds me a lot of like what some other really hip bands are doing these days like there, there's a lot of similar kinds of like styles and textures to like snarky puppy on, really? that, on that album just like just like with like electric bass and all this percussion and and horns and and woodwinds and, and the kinds of grooves that they're playing, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very much kind of like more like funk fusion groove, jazz, jazz, yeah. right? Yeah, and trombone, whatever you say. Hey Paul, are you gonna put in a lot? Well, we'll park and then well we'll like get out front and unload stuff and then I'll figure out what to do from there. Here. And that's a hydrant. Uh, um, KB saxophone repair is right there. Yep, and so you're gonna make a right, right there, uh, at this street, and then pinch is like just on this street right here. So pretty much any anywhere you find parking, that might even be a spot. They're behind there. They're behind you get a park there. Park there. I don't want anyone to park there. I might that's have fine. to around and try again. That's cool. Right there. Where? There. Nope. That's no, that's spot. That's driveway. So Over pinch here? is like right there. Yep, pinch is like right here. Thank you.
Or like, you know, write new music, get better at music, you know. Music is like, there's so much to it that it's like literally a never-ending process, you know. So like, always trying to better yourself is literally like the reason, you know, to keep going, you yeah. know, because you realize the better you get, the more you realize you need to shit, you know. So there's that and, and balancing it with everything else is tough, you know, like, yeah, it's hard because you need to figure out a way to make money, yeah. you know, um, and, yeah. and, you know, in order to do that, you have to play gigs you don't always want to play yeah. or work jobs you don't always want to play or <laughs> jobs you want to play jobs that you want to do everybody finds their own balance i feel like you know you have your way of doing it i have my way and you know they're similar in a lot of respects you know like like i said before you know i graduated school and i started working at a music store right you know like i wasn't like playing some people are like people are lucky and they're really good out of college or know the right people and they get on crazy awesome gigs right away that wasn't that's not what happened with me you know i had like a couple of cool gigs every now and then like maybe like a teacher from purchase or somebody would call me for or recommend me for but you know i i pretty much started more towards the bottom you know you're not playing all the gigs and x y and z is out there doing you know oh they're playing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. birdland or whatever and like you're at the store working like what were you thinking about like was you're like man i really hate this or you're like you know i'm on the path and this is what i gotta do no yeah no i hear you uh i mean i actually i didn't really mind working so much you know at the store no, i just graduated school i was trying to trying to play more and more i was shedding a lot so like I was happy. I was happy that I had a chance to make money, be somewhat involved, you know, close closely with music if I wasn't actually playing and meeting players. It was like still I was still like inspired. I was just like I was younger and I was just like, let's do this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was kinda like that. I worked at the Cornelia Street Cafe, you know, mm -hmm. for a really long time. A really long time. And uh yeah, it was like I met so many people on the scene because I was like everybody would come through and want to play there sure. and but I had to you know bartend and serve drinks and you know but it was a good way to like save money and you know get ahead and do my projects and then eventually people were like oh yeah you're a saxophone player and you're doing this to like get ahead in the music world mm -hmm. but you're also mm -hmm. like paying your bills while you're doing it yeah it's a means to an end but if that means ends up being something that's at least like related to what you want to do it only helps you yeah. know so yeah we all have our different ways Let's talk about the ride. Yeah, so this is a crazy random job. It was fun. Um, it was fun. It was fun, and I made some friends, some that I still even keep in touch with and play with right. to this day. Um, but yeah, I like went online one day because I was like, okay, I'm not working at this music store anymore. I need to figure out how I'm going to make some money besides just hoping people call me for games. Right, and by playing the saxophone, too. Right, right. Which, so oddly enough, ironically enough, like I found this audition for this bus company, which basically they take you on uh, like a tour throughout New York City. And everybody on the bus isn't facing forward. They're faced like in stadium style seats to the side. Right. And there's, the whole window on the side is open. So anyway, they have different you know, actors, musicians and stuff because along this ride. it's an interactive tour experience. It's like an experience. interactive tour, yeah. And it's pretty fun to take, actually. Like, actually, it's really fun to take. Yeah, and it was like informative and, you know, if the ride is listening, I liked it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? But uh, so, so our role as a saxophone player, as you all know, too, yeah. because you did this also, I also did this. stand on the side of the street with like a, a headphone and a microphone. You know, like wireless. Headphones. Yeah, like wireless headphones and a microphone so everybody that's on the bus can hear you talking. And I'm supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be acting like we're busking. Yeah, we're just like random people on the street busking. And like all of a sudden this giant bus pulls up and like... We, oh, hey, what's up, everybody? How yeah, you doing? Yeah, and we interact directly with the bus and they can all see us. And there's lights like all around the bus like flashing in their eyes. But we're on the street looking at this big bus. Just like an audience of people like on this bus staring down at you. Yeah, and it's playing, like... Playing for them. So weird and disconnected from music like in any sort of way. The thing is that, yeah, it, it, it was in a lot of ways. I mean, I was grateful to have that job too. And I kind of had... I had a lot of fun at times. But like when it would go on to like the winter. Like I oh, remember yeah. playing 
in a blizzard and I was freezing cold standing outside. <laughs> I was so cold, my fingers, I, I brought mittens with right, me. Right, yeah. And, you know, as as if anybody that plays saxophone would know, mittens are not particularly well adapted to playing the saxophone. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah, I just remember, like, standing outside of my, at the time, like, my Selmer Mark VI, just getting snow on it. I was out like, playing. what am I doing right now? Yeah, I was out playing, and I would play, like, four notes, and it was so cold that the spit would go into the horn, and then it would freeze, and the keys would freeze. Yep, yep, my pads used to freeze to my horn. Yeah. As soon as the moisture would accumulate on the pad, it would freeze to the metal. The summer times, I'd play outside, and I'd just practice and play solo saxophone all day. Yeah, and the funny thing is some people would actually think you're busking for real. Yeah. They just give you money anyway. Yeah, so I got like, one guy right, cool. gave me a hundred bucks. Like, he just was like, dude, you're out here, like, every day. It's like, well, he's like, you're not out here every day. It's like, you're back. And I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, you sound great. And he just, like, gave me a hundred. And I was like, yes. That's amazing. I had a lady that walked, that worked, like, on the second floor in some office come out and just start screaming at me. Yeah. You're here every day. You're annoying the crap <laughs> out of me. Yeah. What's the deal with this? You need to go somewhere else. I'm going to call the cops on you. I'm like, I'm really sorry. I'm just, I'm hired to be here. This is the company I work for. Please don't call the cops on me. Like, yeah. I'm just doing my job, yeah. you know? So but I she, had, yeah. so the end of my ride experience was, um, it was someone freaking out on me. So they had, we used to stand in front of the Wellington Hotel. Yep, that's where I was. Like, yep. right next to Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. And then, ironically. Yeah. And then, so it was, there was construction there that day, or forever. And right. they moved us down closer to Times Square. But the spot they moved us to was kind of like a panhandler spot. This was his spot that he oh. went to like every day. And he thought I was moving in on his territory. Mm -hmm. And he was not happy about it. Yeah. And so like I pull my horn out and I'm standing there and the ride pulls up and I start playing and he immediately comes over and starts yelling at me while the ride is right here. And the real I'm, busker is that yelling at you while you're, oh my god. Yeah, this dude's yelling at me while I'm playing, and I'm also like a little nervous, like, is this guy gonna hurt me or whatever? Sure, yeah. You know, I do my bit, the ride pulls away, and this guy, like, yells at me for like a second. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, this is my spot, like, this is my spot, like, you can't be here, I've been here forever, and I was like, I'm just trying to, whatever, and he didn't, he wouldn't listen to me at all. Mm -hmm. The bus goes away, he goes back to his spot, you know. Uh, second bus comes, I gotta do it again. He oh, comes no. running over even more irate, you know, like crazy, like crazy irate. And this time, like, I go onto the bus and perform because I told him, like, I'm not, I don't feel safe. Yeah. You know, and I get on the bus, I do my skit, and I get off the bus, and he comes running at me again. And I thought, like, I was about to get into, like, a fist fight with this guy. Oh, my God. And, like, self-defense, like, I will take my saxophone and defend myself, you know, because I'm not going to get hurt. You know, because some lunatic is like, whatever. Sure, yeah. And so I put my horn by my side and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, what's gonna happen? He yells at my face for a little bit and threatens to like beat me up and then goes away. And that's when I was like, I'm quitting. I quit the ride. Sounds like a good spot to draw the line. Yeah. yeah. And that was the end of the ride for me. Oh man. Well, you know, <laughs> you had a good run, I guess. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, it was a good job. It was cool. I got a lot of practice, but when it was like, I'm not safe, yeah. I'm done. So why do you like Bobby Porcelli and Dick Oates as your favorite lead alto players? I mean, there's so many amazing, you know, lead alto players. So it's, you know, not to say anything about about anybody else at all. Just those guys have been specifically influential to me. I think it's just a, a lot of it is because of the music that I checked out. You know, like I I literally did grow up listening to like the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. Like yeah. that was probably like one of the first jazz records that I heard. That I, where I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I want this is something that I want to do. Yeah, you know. Um, and Os was all over all those records, you know. Um, and then also with just like you know checking out so much Latin music and, and you know Tito Puente and um, you know even with one of my teachers at Purchase, Ray Vega, who did a lot of records with with Bobby Porcelli, I, I got to become familiar with Porcelli's playing and just they both have they both have different sounds, but they both just play in such a such like a clear, strong, 
um, like authoritative way. When you heard Oates play, was there something in his sound timbrely that you were like, man, I'm really drawn to that mm -hmm. color, you know, and mm -hmm. like the, whatever. How would you describe that? Yeah, he has like such a unique, amazing sound. I mean, it's it's kind of bright and cutting, but also really warm and um, and focused and just unique and, and personal and yeah. just I mean you know I've sat next to him I've heard him just play a single note and there's just so much vibe behind like one note that he plays yeah I know yeah because it's, it's incredible like just yeah. the amount of of information he has just in his sound alone it, yeah it's amazing you know and then what about Bobby and his sound yeah sure well Bobby's kind of like a little I feel like I mean this is my personal take on it but I feel like he has more of like a classic big lead out those sound where yeah. it's just like it's just like big and brilliant and, and, and fat and cutting. It's just like so like kind of macho sounding. It was just like, oh damn, this is a this is nasty, man. So you, you know? got to play with the Vanguard band at the Vanguard. And for me, like that's one of like the you know, the pinnacle of rooms and jazz like to play in. You know, like could you talk like what was that room like? Like what was it like playing up on that stage and like the sound and like, how did that feel? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was amazing. I mean, first of all, like, the first time I got called to go play there, I was, like, a total nervous wreck. Yeah. You know, um, because, like, the, the first time I got called to sub, you know, it's a Monday night band. I think I got called, like, the Sunday the day before. Right. So, like, from the second I put down my phone, yeah. I instantly picked up my horns, and I did nothing but shed, basically, until I had the gig the next day. Right. Um, just because I was nervous and I wanted to be on point, make sure I had all my greeds and be warmed up on all my doubles and everything that I may have to play. Yeah. You know, um, and I got there really early. Everybody was super nice. You know, I mean, I, I've known most of those guys for a while because a lot of them taught or still do teach at either SUNY Purchase or Manhattan School of Music, uh -huh. the two schools I went to. Uh -huh. So, like, you know, just getting in there was, was kind of cool. Um, but, like, just being on that side of the band and like hearing that room it's actually the room sounds amazing i mean if you if that's what i've heard i haven't you know like to get to play there that's why i'm asking it's like such a big honor you know yeah yeah and the room it, it everyone was. says the room playing up there is like fantastic the sound is amazing you can hear everything really well everybody's sense of time and phrasing in that band is just like it's so incredibly strong, yeah. you know, um, that you have kind of no choice but to get with it. You know, that music and like playing the Thad Jones in that style, um, in that room with all these guys that have been playing it together, you know, for all these years. Right, like, because they've been there it's forever. It's just like this established thing. Yeah, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. you know, so you just kind of, in, in a way, it's it's almost easy because it's, it's an easy thing to just kind of follow along and, yeah. just, and get with. Um, but it, it was it was nerve wracking, but it, it, it sounded amazing. So, what do you see like on the future? Not just like project wise, but mm -hmm. like as the overall big picture like direction you know because like for me like oh I want to make a record or I want to do a project but I don't know if that that always like gets me further you know what I mean like what do you yeah. see the next sort of like round of things being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well I'm I'm pretty confident that once this video comes out my career is gonna skyrocket oh yeah so, <laughs> so, there, so there's that but I'll, I'll <laughs> no but I, yeah it, it's tough it's tough because like you know, the scene is super different now, like with internet and social media and everything. Like, it's a little hard to almost tell because things are evolving at such a fast rate. Like, yeah. what do we do? You know, like, I, I'm, I'm honestly, my two goals are just to look at, well, okay, so I look at every year and just did this year improve from the last year? Am yeah. I playing more gigs? Am I working with more people? Am I doing more of the kinds of things that I want to be doing? And of course, from a financial perspective too, am I actually making more money or did I make less money this year than last year? Why? And kind of analyze those reasons. You know, I like being based in New York City, even though I tour a lot, but just to kind of like work with better musicians yeah. and or, you know, play better, cooler gigs. That and you are, just have faith that that's going to keep moving you forward and better opportunities are going to come along as in, long as... In a way, in a way. And like, yeah, that's kind of passive in a way, but... But, you know, I also want to work on, on more of my own albums. I want to, you know, you know, I do like a lot of studio work for different kinds of artists that aren't even, you know, 
jazz artists, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I've done some cool recordings for like some bigger hip hop people and stuff like that, where I've gotten some like writing credits and you know publishing credits, and that's something I I kind of didn't even realize or never really thought would be something that yeah. I would do, but I I kind of love it, you know, like yeah. I love working in studios and I do a lot of different types of studio work, so like yeah, like being like a horn arranger or you know writing charts like that or and going to the studio and recording them is something that I'd like to do a lot more, you know. Yeah, I remember a long time ago we had a conversation uh, on the stoop of our apartment mm -hmm. where it was like, it was probably like a year or two after school and we were hanging out and you were talking about wanting to be involved in different types of music. Like you felt mm -hmm. like you didn't want to get pigeonholed into just being a lead alto player. And you like yeah, really yeah, yeah. wanted to be like involved in groove music and hip hop and things like that. And mm -hmm. it was really a goal for you. How did you sort of make that transition, you know, as being a jazz player in the city and then also getting involved in different scenes? Mm -hmm. I started, like, honestly, the first thing I did was I just started going. There was this session, that, it still happens, called Freestyle Mondays. And like back in like 2012, 2013, I started hanging, maybe even earlier than that, like 2011. I started hanging out there and sitting in, and so there there would just be like these hip hop bands, you know, and different MCs would come up and rap, and I would just be like, well, let me just see if I can get up there with my saxophone and play, like come up with some, you know, some horn lines, you know, maybe play a solo here and there, and just like be involved in this stuff too, because um, it was like I loved the music and it was like a way to actually do it, you know. Yeah. And so from hanging out there, I met a whole bunch of people, you know, and started being in this the house band for this other um, this other session that was happening at Arlene's Grocery called The Lesson and I met like so many musicians just doing that and kind of leading the horn section like every Thursday night there yeah. for for a bunch of years you know and even like through that I met like a whole other scene of people that I didn't realize exist I'm like well this is like a whole thing that's sort of untapped as far as like work I could be doing you know and I'm like I'm down to do it, you know? I, yeah, I like that it, kind of music too. How know? does it make you feel now that you've, like, you're involved in both of these scenes? Like, you know, like, you're like, oh man, I play the Vanguard band, but then also, like, I got to get writing credits on, like, a Mac Miller project, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. and things like that. How do you, how's that feeling and how's the world looking for the future and all that? It's awesome. I mean, I love it. You know, I want, it's, it's fun. Like, I want to take both of those avenues and, and go as far as I can with each of them, you know? And, you know, I wish they weren't always so separated. You yeah. Know? There's a lot of different stuff we could be doing right right now. Well, multiple skills and like taking all the areas you're interested in and, and like doing them as well. Yeah. Because it's a complicated world. Yeah. But it's also that's exactly fun. It. And it's fun. <laughs> all right. Andrew, thank you so much for being here. Um, Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's been really fun. And watch out for the Snap Saxophone Quartet. Yeah, Snap. Where can people find you in the world, you know, and all mm -hmm. that? Yeah, sure. Well, I usually I try to update my website pretty regularly. It's just www.andrewgouldmusic.com. Uh, or other than that, you can find me on Instagram, just Andrew underscore Gould. Close talking. Close talking. Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay. <laughs> this is good. I mean, I think don't hesitate to like look in the camera. <laughs> We're serious. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like the fast motion like yeah into it yeah the new york times says they want to put <sighs> parking bans and charge people for parking uptown oh i like that i think they should stay downtown in their midtown lives where they belong no i think they should charge people for parking uptown that's not for residents not for residents is fine resident parking okay cool oh yeah i'm so tired i didn't do anything today well, that's not true. We 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 were. Worked. We've been working all day long. So now what? My eyes are watered. <laughs> what?
Only 96% left of the show to go. What time is it? It's like 4.40, 4 4.45. We're gonna get crushed with traffic. Going into the city? I don't know. I don't know. Will we have to be looking for parking? Uh, yes. <laughs> we will be looking for parking. <laughs>